watching us uh, uh, on uh, Google Meet uh, from a uh, Google Meet on YouTube, and I want to welcome today uh, at like uh, our uh, project Collegium Carpaticum, our professor uh, from the uh, University from uh, Stefan Selmari University from Suchava in Romania, Tudor Bandunshau, who has a very interesting and very, uh, we can say, cultural and topic, which is uh, very unusual. Mm, and I think uh, that is ballet, choreography, and literature. It's like a topic of a dream of uh, every uh, intellectual person. Uh, that's why I'm not wonder that a few people from the uh, Warsaw Academy uh, of Arts uh, are here because I see that it's a connection from the hmm. Academy of uh, Art. And I welcome these people and thank you for connecting us. So these lectures are um, taking place uh, in a support in, uh, of the uh, International Visegrad Fund. And dear professor, we are welcome you. We are very happy and thankful that you are agreed to make a lecture for us. And I give you a word. Thank you. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to present. Um, I would like to start with um, by asking the participants to think about which of the dancers in these two images they would identify with. And I would like to give you uh, 30 seconds in kind of in silence to think about that. Normally, I would make this much more interactive, but I think it's not feasible. Um, so it's not feasible to hear your answers. Uh, and instead of that, just for, for the next 30 seconds, and by way of introduction, think about who of the dancers you would identify with. It can be one of the dancers in the background and one or or the dancer in the foreground in the top left image, or it can be um, one of the dancers in the background in the top bottom image. Uh, you or one of the three dancers in the foreground. So just think about it. You don't have to answer. To give me the answer. This is just hmm? yes. Uh, you mean uh, the whom like a person. Uh, like a, okay, mm -hmm. I will I will read the comments for you if you not remind. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're waiting for comments on the YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a one comment for this moment, and uh, Sylvia Grzeszek from the. Uh, Okay, from the Ethnology Faculty of University of Warsaw, uh, wrote to us, is there Nikolai Borishnikov? Uh, I think that no, because as far as I know, Nikolai Borishnikov is uh, very old. Yes, no, it's, um, <laughs> this is uh, from a performance that we organized at the University of Suchava. Oh. Well, this is our day. Yes, I will come back to it throughout the lecture, so there will be more information on that. Okay, so if, if every, everyone has an idea of who they are, uh, who represents <laughs> them best in these two images, we'll, we'll just move on and keep that in mind. It's not, it's, there's no, uh, you know, there's no right or wrong answer, you don't have to tell me. Okay. And um, yes, this is the title of the lecture, Literature and Choreography of Social Performance. I divided it into six sections of roughly 10 minutes each. So we will start by um, focusing on Bruno Latour's concept of traditional subject and articulated body. And then we will go back to, the, um, to some images from the performance, uh, um, same performance from which the two images above before were taken, and because we try to illustrate Latour's concepts to dance, and so we will talk about that a bit, and we will have gained some insight on on the connection between first between philosophy and dance, and then we will use that insight to do a, some brief analysis of uh, excerpts of texts 
from James Joyce and William Butler Yeats. And then we will try to figure out why, why is this important? Why should we connect literature and dance and choreographies, what I call choreographies of social performance? And I will start with uh, um, the most difficult part, and I put it at the beginning because everyone is uh, still not bored. And uh, um, to understand the difference between traditional subject and articulated body, these two concepts are defined by Bruno Latour, but to understand them, we need to understand Latour's broader theoretical framework. And while I try to explain it, it's a very complex theory, so Yes, it will be difficult to explain, <laughs> but I will try it, and I will try to do it in three minutes. So, but while I do that, please try to think um, about where in this schema that you see, where would you situate the traditional subject, and where would you situate the articulated body? And we will answer that eventually. But just think about it while I talk um, while I talk about Latour's broader theoretical framework. So um, I think you're all familiar with um, the traditional dichotomy that uh, it's been with us for um, ever, so, ever since, I suppose, classical philosophy. Uh, and that is a dichotomy that separates nature from culture. So we, we work with this dichotomy very often, nature versus culture, which um, also means that we work with the dichotomy non-human versus human. And Latour takes this dichotomy and argues that nature and culture are not separated by an abysmal wedge. Um, they're not in a transcendental relation to each other, but nature and culture form together a hybrid network. So what he says is that this dichotomy, nature versus culture, is in fact wholly situated within culture. So he says this is a cultural construction, this dichotomy the nature in the dichotomy culture versus nature is not the real nature it's only a, a purified image of nature that we have constructed culturally and because he uh, argues in favor of this perspective on the nature versus culture dichotomy he creates a second dichotomy and you can see then the the second dichotomy is the one that separates the first dichotomy from the top half of the image from the bottom half of the image. In the bottom half, we have nature and culture intermingled in a hybrid network, and so the human and non-human are also intermingled. So um, the, uh, an image that he uses very often, he works within the sociology of science, is that of a scientist looking through a microscope to, I don't know, seeing some, investigating some microbes, if you employ the top half of the image to analyze this scientist looking through the microscope, then the scientist would be situated within culture. The microscope would be the vertical line separating him from nature, and the microbes would be nature. But Latour refocuses um, his analysis and sees the scientists, the microscope, and the microbes as forming a hybrid network. So you cannot separate them. Um, okay, so this, is, <laughs> this was the difficult part, I think. And then uh, we will come back to it. But before that, let's read this dialogue. I think it's a very nice dialogue. It's an imaginary dialogue written by Latour, which takes place between the traditional subject and the articulated body. And I will try to read it as, um, as poetical or you know, <laughs> as, as poetical as I can. So this is how it goes. Ah, sighs the traditional subject. If only I could extract myself from this narrow-minded body and roam through the cosmos, unfettered by an instrument, I would see the world as it is without words, without models, without controversies, silent and contemplative. So I think here um, we see the traditional subject as one who is very idealistic. Uh, he, aims for, he aims for transcendence. He wants to leave this material world to 
and transcend high above it, maybe in a, a realm of platonic ideals, and from there to have some sort of absolute truth, to see the world as it is, without words, without models, without controversy. It's like a little bit like um, um, what, what might happen in Buddhist practice. So you transcend the material world, and then you have absolute knowledge. And to this, the articulated body replies. Really, he replies the articulated body with some benign surprise. Why do you wish to be dead? For myself, I want to be alive, and thus I want more words, more controversies, more artificial settings, more instruments, so as to become sensitive to even more differences. My kingdom for a more embodied body. So uh, the articulated body is, is one who does not want to transcend. He, he would rather live in this, in this realm of um, necessity and becoming, which is life, and life is embodied. And for that, to, to fully experience this embodied life needs more words, as in literature, and more controversies, as in literature, uh, more artificial settings. I think this would mostly refer to science, more artificial settings, more instruments, so that he can become sensitive uh, to, to more differences. He does not wish an absolute, if he does not look for an absolute truth, he looks for, um, for, for, for the differences that are specific to a hybrid network, a fine, a fine network of, uh, of shades of human, non-human culture, nature. So if you go back to the, to the schema, this is where, uh, in my understanding, where the traditional subject and the articulated body would be located. The traditional subject lives only within culture. Um, he aims to transcend nature. He looks at nature over uh, this abysmal wedge, over this, uh, uh, yes, wedge. <laughs> To, to nature, but he does not partake of nature. He, he would rather leave nature behind and be a holy spiritual being, a work of purification. Whereas the articulated body is fully immersed in uh, human non human networks, uh, hybrid networks, and nature culture hybrid networks. So we try to illustrate these two concepts, traditional subject and articulated body in a dance performance. This has been, um, has uh, brought together um, 10 dancers from four continents. We had um, Egyptian dancers, Finnish, American from the US, uh, Colombian, Canadian, and Romanian, of course. And uh, I would like to show you the clip if I can. I don't know if this is possible, um, but I will try. It's a 30 seconds. Um, advertising clip for our dance performance, and I would like to show it because I think it shows some nice examples of um, articulated bodies, and we will see later why I call them, I call dancers articulated bodies. So I'll just try to play the clip. If it doesn't work, I'll move on, but I'll try this. So that, um, that kind of work. And so I will use some images from that performance now. Um, and uh, this is one of them. And I'd like to ask you to think about where in this image, which of the dancers in this image represent the traditional subject and which of the dancers represent the articulated body. So uh, this is something that you might think about for uh, 20, 30 seconds. So where in this image would, would the traditional subject be? With, which of the dancers represent the traditional subject and which represent the articulated body? Is this uh, girl with a hand representing a traditional body? 
Yes, yes, of course, yes. So then, uh, okay, the answer has been revealed. We move on to um, a nice, I think, a very nice um, um, figure, image, that brings together that still from the performance and the uh, Latour schema. And you can kind of very clearly see the, if you extend the line, the vertical line um, designated as the first dichotomy, then you see that it almost passes through the middle of the vertical middle of the image. And then on the right, you have this um, oriental dancer, which is from Egypt. And she represents the, in a nice way, because she's the oriental, yes, she hasn't always been accepted, or the orientals haven't always been accepted within um, Western cultures. But she's there, and, um, and she represents humans' culture. And the posture is uh, designed to suggest idealism. She's like um, also aiming for some sort of transcendence. Or her, her position expresses that. And, um, and she's a little bit like a statue, like uh, the highest art that we, we can, we humans have, we think we have created. And of course, on the left side, there's nothing because nature is, um, it doesn't have a place in this image. If you separate nature from culture, then it, it kind of, nature is kind of included in culture in, in that purified form. And then uh, on the bot in the bottom half of the image, we have the hybrid networks. Um, the, I, I think what it's called the realm of the living stream of life. And this is maybe where we live. Um, we always interact with other people. We, we always touch people or material forms in the environment. And this is maybe the, the, <clears throat> the more real uh, part of, uh, of life, the realm of the articulated body. Now, all dancers, I should say it right away, all dancers are articulated bodies because they work with the environment and they touch surfaces, they touch textures, they touch other dancers, they move a lot. So all dancers are uh, more clearly representing articulated bodies, but for the purposes of our performance, we try to separate, try to to, um, to use uh, these articulated bodies to represent the traditional subject, which in the end is, is not possible, but we try. And uh, then this is basically what I have to say about the, um, the, um, my explanation of Latour's concepts, and I will try to use them to analyze a fragment of text from James Joyce. This is uh, from a portrait of the artist as a young man. It's the moment when Stephen Dedalus realizes uh, he has an epiphany. Uh, this, this text describes um, part of that epiphany. And in this epiphany, he realizes that his vocation is to be a writer. So this is when he realizes, you know, it is revealed to him um, something that he hasn't seen before, that he should be a writer. I, I underlined uh, some of the words that I thought were relevant, and I will quickly read this bit. So, um, now as never before, his strange name seemed to him a prophecy. So timeless seemed the gray warm air, so fluid and impersonal his own mood, that all ages were as one to him. Now, at the name of the fabulous artificer, he seemed to hear the noise of dim waves and to see a wing form flying above the waves and slowly climbing the air. What did it mean? Was it a quaint device opening a page of some medieval book of prophecies and symbols? A hawk-like man flying sunward above the sea? The prophecy of the end he had been born to serve and has been following through the mists of childhood and boyhood, a symbol of the artist forging anew in his workshop out of the sluggish matter of the earth a new, soaring, impalpable, imperishable being. So when I read this, when, if we read this text through Latour's concepts, then uh, what I think is represented here is a traditional subject. And to the right, you have uh, the, the, the bit of text from Latour's dialogue, and you can use that to um, compare the, the, 
Latour's understanding of the traditional subject with the description of the of the spirit of the writer, uh, the, this impalpable, imperishable being that uh, Stephen Dedalus aspires to become. So yes, he is trying to extract himself from this narrow-minded body. Yes, his winged form flying above the waves, slow, slowly climbing the air, uh, roam through the cosmos, um, and see the world as it is without words, without models, silent and contemplative as a soaring, impalpable, imperishable being might be. So he aims a little bit for transcendence here. Um, for, for, in fact, he aims, he aims for pure objectivity. James Joyce wanted to, at some point in his career, wanted to become um, that writer who is completely detached from the world, um, who, who can arrest the world into some sort of stasis and describe it. But he never wanted to, um, to give up the sensuality of the world. And we see that in um, the next slide, which describes uh, Stephen Dedalus has, has had the experience described above, above, but this fragment, which follows, which immediately follows, is um, more focused on the body. And uh, it goes, his heart trembled, his breath came faster, and a wild spirit passed over his limbs as though he were soaring sunward. His heart trembled in an ecstasy of fear, and his soul was in flight. His soul was soaring in an air beyond the world, and the body he knew was purified in a breath, and delivered of incertitude, and made radiant and commingled with the element of the spirit. An ecstasy of flight made radiant his eyes, and wild his breath, and tremulous and wild and radiant his wind-swept limbs. So although here um, um, Stephen is still aiming for um, transcendence, to leave, he aims to leave this material world, um, to gain some absolute um, truth that he can express in his he can express in his writing. He is nevertheless uh, very much remains anchored in the world of material life, and this is a hint that through uh, some words that. To me, it seems described very, very ph physiological reactions. So his heart trembled, his heart rate increased probably, his breath um, came faster. Uh, and even though, uh, even though he imagines himself soaring, leaving this world, soaring sunward, um, his eyes become radiant, uh, probably um, his pupil dilate, uh, his uh, breath goes wild, and uh, uh, his limbs come tremulous and wild and radiant. So this is all very physiological to me. And it is more like this part of Stephen is, um, is the, um, here it is, is more similar to the articulated body. So he wants, he maybe does not realize it, but he, he does not completely repudiate the embodied body. He enjoys this experience physically, even though in thought he aims to transcend. And uh, so if you look at, at this image again, then um, I would say that <clears throat> Stephen is represented by the dancer in the foreground. So um, the dancer in the foreground, the which represents the articulated body, we can probably, we don't see his eyes, but probably they're radiant. And um, yes, the, the, the words on the right seem to apply very well to the image of the dancer in the foreground. He's in an ecstasy of flight, his breath is tremulous and wild, and his limbs are windswept almost. You can see if the wind were flowing from the right to the left, then it would sweep his limbs leftwards. So um, yes, this is one of the, uh, um, so, okay, uh, we, cannot, we cannot really decide if Stephen is a traditional subject or an articulated body, and we don't have to, we will see why, but I think it's in interesting to see both sides of this, um, uh, this literary character, but a literary character that, that in some way represents many of us. And then another example of analysis is um, Yeats's poetry. And Yeats had, um, had worked with, 
again, he's a, he, he, got Nobel, he got the Nobel Prize for Literature in the 20s. He's a very complex writer, and it's also very difficult with him, as is with Joyce, to, to put things into boxes. But he worked with two, um, one might say, um, one might risk saying that he worked with two major concepts, the statuary and the living stream. So the statuary is, um, you can, he imagines it as a stone, sometimes a magical stone, uh, that sits in a river, and uh, the living stream is the river. So um, then he, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the people he knew would be classified, sort of classified by him into these two categories. One could be the stone troubling the living stream, another people would be more more like flowing with the living stream. And this fragment is from Sailing to Byzantium. Uh, in this um, poem, it's a very famous poem, it was made famous by the film No Country for Old Men. Uh, the, these uh, lines appear, uh, well, no, Yates made famous the music, probably. <laughs> these lines, No Country for Old Men, are um, included in this poem, and they are included because this is where the poet realizes that he has grown old and um, he is um, unhappy with, uh, with, with being old. He thinks there is nothing left to him in, uh, in the sensual world to experience and then he aspires to transcendence. And it, it, I think it's always interesting to ask yourself, and I ask myself, if, if I do aspire to transcendence, and reading these words from Yeats, O sages standing in God's holy fire, as in the gold mosaic of a wall, come from the holy fire, turn in a guy and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away, sick with desire and pass into a dying animal, it knows not what it is, and gather me into the articles of eternity. So this is where he expresses his dissatisfaction with being old. His uh, heart is sick with desire, but passed into a dying animal, his aging body. So rather than have this, he, he invokes the um, uh, sages standing in God's holy fire to help him transcend the materiality of the body. And once that is done, this is in stanza four, once out of nature I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing, but such a form as Gresham Goldsmith make, a hammered gold and golden amulet to keep a Gauss emperor awake or set upon a golden bow to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. So here I, I think um, the poet aspires to become more like the traditional subject. He wants to extract himself from this aging body and um, um, have access to that realm of platonic ideals to the uh, um, realm of essences. Uh, he, he refers to that when he says he wish she would take a form as Gresham Goldsmith's make. Um, like um, he would, uh, would, in a way, want, he would want to become an archetype, but one that has aesthetic perfection because he, uh, gold, the goldsmiths create art objects of hammered gold and gold enameling. So he wants to be in that world, unfettered by any instrument, not tied to the body. But not always. In, um, in another poem, uh, among school children, we have these very famous lines. If you know Yeats, and even, even if you don't know Yeats, you might have heard this last line, how can we know the dancer from the dance? And um, so I will read the entire um, the stanza. Labor is blossoming or dancing where the body is not bruised to pleasure soul, nor beauty born out of its own despair, nor blee right wisdom out of midnight toil. O oh, chestnut tree, great witted blossomer, I will believe the blossom or the bowl. O oh, body sway to music, O oh, brightening glance, how can we know the dancer from the dance? So here I think uh, this is where Yeats is um, uh, veers from, um, he questions the value of transcendence. He says that labor, labor is blossoming not where the body is bruised to pleasure soul, 
So he would rather not bruise the body in order to, for his soul to be satisfied. Um, and uh, where, in doing that, he would find some kind of sensual beauty that it's not born out of despair. So um, I, if I try to imagine this in a, in a, like a video clip, I would say that there's this soul that is desperately trying to reach somewhere, uh, desperately, uh, but that these lines tell me that this is not, this doesn't seem right. This labor is not blossoming, it's not dancing, it's, it's more like toil. So um, then here he, he, I think he's trying to find some sort of a different kind of wisdom, a wisdom that is more related to embodiment, to the living stream, body straight music, brightening glance. We remember uh, uh, Joyce's very similar words, uh, radiant uh, eyes, he said. And here we have brightening glance, body sway to music here, wind swept limbs we had in Joyce. So, um, yes. Um, okay, so uh, we're looking at this, um, again at this photo which we used with Joyce, we can also use it in an analysis of Yeats's poetry. And the way I see it, the dancers in the background represent the, um, the traditional subject, the one who in Yeats's words would transcend nature and never take bodily form from natural things. But, the, but also the foreground dancers, we have the foreground dancer, he would represent the, the other the, the, um, um, images contained in the second excerpt from Yeats. Where, where he talked about body swayed to music, brightening glance. So uh, the, the question is, um, and I'm slowly coming to, I think, my point, of uh, how, how is this relevant to um, why should we do this kind of analysis? It, it, it seems like a very, um, in a way, a very artificial, it's more like a, an artifice, critical artifice, but I think it's more than that. And uh, the, the key question uh, for me was uh, which of the two I would rather be? I think this is also the question that Bruno Latour asks. So it's not my question. This is just the question of general human interest. But who, who would I rather be? Would I rather be the articulated body or uh, would I rather be the traditional subject? Because the traditional subject is not to be um, dismissed easily. He is a, um, or she is an idealistic person, a person that has their eyes on, on ideals, on archetypes, on a, a quest for an absolute truth, and this is important. But it is also important to pay attention to the flow of life. So, um, yes, uh, the question is which is healthier? And uh, uh, this concept of choreographies of social performance is about identifying uh, with the traditional subject or the articulated body. So basically, who would you identify with? This is, a, this is the question that uh, I would launch. <clears throat> we saw that Yates and Joyce would, would not give a definite answer. Um, there is some part of us is like the articulated body and some other part is like the traditional subject. But at one point we may be more the traditional subject than the articulated body. And some other time we can, we can be more the articulated body than the traditional subject. And this affects how we relate to the world and other people because if we are in a, a mood for transcendence then we will be less uh, connected in material ways to the people and the material world around us. And if we are in an articulated body mood, then we are we're not very philosophical. But instead, we um, appreciate the, the sensuality of our existence. So um, I'm looking at this, I thought I could, it would be interesting to frame them in, um, um, in an analysis that tries to figure out which is healthier. Is it healthier to be 
which should you be more? I mean, a theory you can be either the traditional subject or the articulated body, but which is healthier? Which should you be more often? And um, uh, so I try to define a psychological universe for the dancers in the background and the dancers in the foreground and find out which represents me. And, uh, and this would also help me negotiate the advantages and disadvantages of the articulated body and versus the traditional subject. So if you look at this picture, if you remember the horizontal line that, that um, separated the dichotomy nature versus culture from the realm of hybrid networks, that line exists in this image as well. It's just, uh, this is in a, but in a three dimensional plane. So the line would be behind the group in the foreground. So here, the group in the foreground represents the, um, the articulated body or the realm of hybrid networks. And that's why the realms are interlinked. And the dancers in the background represent the realm of the traditional subject. They toil a lot. There is solidarity between traditional subjects. Uh, the solidarity that is um, that brings us together around an ideal and makes us work towards that, towards that ideal that didn't sound very right, makes us work. It's, it's not a, an entirely displeasurable work. And there is um, beauty in, us, in aspiring to fulfill ideals. Uh, but, there, um, so, but there is more, more, a different kind of solidarity in the group in the forefront, uh, forefront. And this is where I thought that the articulated body better suggests or represents our need for empathy and uh, that kind of solidarity. So not the solidarity that comes from uh, that comes when we are enlisted in the service of an ideal, but a more humane solidarity where you touch people, where it is important to, to be near them, look at them. And um, then I define these uh, provisional um, teachers of the traditional subject and the articulated body that have some, some sort of um, psychological relevance. The traditional subject is idealistic, aspires to perfection, wants to transcend this world, values spirit over body, mind over matter. Uh, this would be the soaring, impalpable, imperishable being Joy spoke about, the, the, right, the perfect writer he wanted to become the one who would, um, by the magic of literature, would transform the sluggish matter of the earth into some radiant aesthetic form. Uh, he, he was being very idealistic there. Um, and then also the lines from Yeats we have here, never take my bodily form from any natural thing, where, Ye where the poet in Yeats's poem also aspire to some sort of aesthetic perfection, um, sort of a golden statue, uh, the, the kind of the, the Grecian goldsmiths make. So uh, these would be literary, literary representations of this idealistic spirit of the traditional subject, of the one who aspires to perfection and wants, aspires to transcendence. Um, but for Yeats, that also means uh, meant that one might behave according to patterns set in stone. And uh, he had this very um, uh, dramatic experience of Irish nationalism during the um, um, Irish the Easter Rising of 1916. Yeats is Irish, was Irish, and um, the subsequent civil war. And then. Um, um, he often saw idealistic people as statues. Um, and, and, and when I say set in stone, I mean those who are more dogmatic, maybe dogmatic is not the right word, but those who, who really believed in, um, in an Ireland that would be transfigured by their sacrifice. So the traditional subject might, might also be a hero capable of sacrifice and the one who will be remembered by future generations, a statue, basically. And then, um, 
this statue is uh, for Yeats is not it's not just a lifeless object. It is a statue that has some that has life in it. It is it cannot move, but it has the life that uh, um, a sort of life of an aesthetic nature. It moves others and it lives by moving others. Um, yes, so. This would be the traditional subject. If I was to be very um, psychological, I would, I would relate the traditional subject to purpose in life. Um, uh, an individual who is very objective, like a scientist, can be a traditional subject, is often a traditional subject, very often. Um, and in terms of a, a social life, this person with someone who is literally larger than ordinary life, uh, what Joyce's writer was Stephen Dedalus aspires to be. He aspired to forge in the smithy of his soul the uncreated conscience of my race. So a very lofty ideal. And, but there are cons to this, and I will just leave to everyone to figure, it, figure them out. Um, and uh, the articulated body, on the other hand, is mindful of the materiality of the body. He's like one of the dancers, one of those dancers in the foreground. Um, he is mindful of the needs, desires, and imperfections of the body. He would not, he would rather not be a soaring, impalpable, imperishable being. He would rather be the one who lets himself or herself um, be contained in the living stream of embodied life, in, in this realm of necessity and becoming. And I see this articulated body as best described through these two lines from Joyce and Yeats, radiant his eyes, wild his breath, tremors and wild and radiant his wings shut limbs, body straight to music, brightening the lungs. One of the advantages of the traditional subject is that they can improvise. So they're not, um, they're not in a fixed position like an in the way an idealistic person would be. An idealistic person would be guided by an ideal, would probably have a set of, a set of uh, of the principles by which they live, but the articulated body is, is improvising. And that, that is an advantage of the articulated body, body because it unlocks potential by moving away from fixed positions. And I also like uh, wanted to highlight the, the material character, um, how the articulated body relishes uh, embodiment. He likes to touch textures, Dancers do that a lot, and that's why I thought dancers were very good to use to represent Gunnar concepts. They touch um, the floor when they dance, when they improvise, they touch other dancers, and this would be uh, a hugger, the articulated, or a touchy feely person. Now, uh, who enjoys the living stream, um, the flow? Uh, I, here, when I wrote The Stone Troubles Him, I thought I was thinking about Yeats's um, image of the stone troubling the living stream, the idealistic traditional subject capable of sacrifice would trouble the articulated body. And uh, in, the articulated body is more subjective and passionate. And I think the, what I see as the cause of the articulated, the identity of the articulated body as, are that, um, pro, uh, pros are that if he or she shows effective empathy, um, is more creative, has wider psychological range because it has more experiences, is more open to experience, sensual experience. And again, the cons, um, this, um, are not, I think, are less important, but it, it would be interesting to try to figure them out. So if we really had to choose, um, this, this is where we're moving towards the end of the presentation, and um, Yes, I, I just wanted to ask this question again, maybe run through some of the images, and then uh, then I will um, offer a more, more um, encompassing conclusion. So if you really had to choose, would I be in the background, or would I be the foreground dancer? And again here, am I the statuary above, or am I the anonymous below? Um, it's not so bad, I think, to be the anonymous. It's maybe easier than to be the uh, statuary. Uh, and again, 
uh, looking at this image, I would often ask myself, am I toiling in the background or am I toiling in the foreground? There is a toiling in the foreground where the articulated body is, but there is more effective empathy as well. So um, every time you have um, a lot of deadlines, you will probably be assume the identity of the traditional subject and be like more like slumped and the, like the dancers in the background. But usually, when we are uh, when we have enough time to be around with other people and manifest you know, effective empathy, that's that's a kind of um, of um, socializing that is also satisfying. I mean, both are. They're both the the work of the traditional subject and that of, of the articulated body are important. Because we don't really have to choose. Um, the, these two concepts, they don't define traditional subject and articulated body. They don't define two different types of human. Um, we could as I already mentioned, we could, we could have both identities, maybe in a sort of combination. So at one, any one point, we could be more the traditional subject than the articulated body, but we could never be only one of these. If we were only the traditional subject, we would not be in this world. We, we would have already transcended nature. Um, and if we were only the articulated body and not the traditional subject, then we would be, you know, this, if we were 100% the articulated body, we would be in the animal world, would be in a pre-cultural or pre-linguistic state. So we have both. The question is, um, yes, how do we negotiate this balance between being an articulated body and a traditional subject? Because we need purpose in life, we need statutory ideals, but we also need effective empathy. We need to feel part of the, um, of the living stream of life. And this photo expresses, um, I think it's an interesting photo because it expresses um, both images. This, if you look at the whole complex, the cluster, it is statuary. Um, it's um, a great rooted blossomer, as you would put it. But it is also, the, the photo also expresses uh, embodied life because the dancers are interlinked. And uh, so this is the image, is, is the final image of our performance, and it is in a way a synthesis between the traditional subject and the articulated body. And I think literature and art are important because um, they help us refer when we read, you know, when we read about Stephen Dedalus's aspiration, his epiphany, we rehearse the identity of the traditional subject and that of the articulated body. And when we read Yeats's, uh, Yeats's troubled um, choice about Yeats's troubled choice between leaving this material world uh, and on the other hand wanting to be in it, that helps us also to negotiate our own identity, uh, the balance between the traditional subject and the articulated body. And this is, I think, uh, this is where uh, this kind of analysis connects to medical humanities because it is important to have to find the balance between being idealistic, having purpose in life, but not to the point where we would um, stifle our need for effective empathy. And when I say effective empathy, I mean that empathy that is engendered um, through haptic coupling when we touch other people. There is cognitive empathy that is more, more I think, uh, part of the identity of a traditional subject where you reason what would you be like, what would it be like in a rational way for me to be another person. But that's um, the effective is um, more um, visceral and uh, more appropriate for describing the identity of the um, articulated body. So this is me. Yeah, I would. If, uh, anyone has questions? I uh, put here um, um, a link to a paper. If you want to learn more, this is a paper that um, describes. Well, it's a paper based on which I devised this presentation. 
and I also um, uh, want to advertise a bit for our neuro neuroesthetics lab. This work in medical community is part of uh, the work of the neuroesthetics lab, and uh, this is the address of the group below. And, uh, Dear Professor, thank you for not only interesting but very inspiring lecture. And say the truth, it's uh, like uh, at morning, uh, I didn't suppose to have so inspiring lecture, really. So thank you, thank you a lot. And I've got a question, even five questions, uh, and not, not even questions, I, I've got a request. Uh, um, to put this uh, um, links, the connection, which you published now, uh, on Facebook. So I really ask you to send this to me on my email. I think that you have it. Yes. And I today will publish this uh, because really I've got such requests and I will publish this, if you not remind, on a Collegium Carpaticum uh, page on Facebook. And uh, to everyone who asked, it will be available today until 2 o'clock, 2 p.m. I will publish this and you can find these links. Thank you. Uh, also, I didn't find the questions, but I found uh, such uh, remarks as the, that this lecture is not about literature and choreography. This lecture about the philosophy of uh, life. Uh, that uh, the comment uh, inspiring uh, lecture about the par purpose of our lives, and I can I can't not agree with this uh, with this thesis because really it's not only about choreography, not only about literature, but I think that uh, with your presentation, with your lecture, uh, you like you give us uh, um, a thought. To thinking about what our life is and what our position in this life are we this statuary uh, are we on the background or are we on the first place and of course uh, listen to you understanding that the, to be on the first plan it's always harder and as you said uh, to be on a background it's always easier so really thank you for this lecture it was it was incredible, really, and I'm not. I'm not connecting with an art, and understand the people who are like asking for links who are from Academy of Art, but I'm not uh, connecting with the art strictly. And for me, it was great lecture, really great. And thank you. And that, that's really. I even I want these links uh, to to look more, to read more about this. Thank you. And uh, sorry, uh, I've got one more lex uh, one more question uh, here uh, in the comments, uh, and uh, uh, it's like it's a question about: uh, Do you have some uh, performances uh, in your university, and can uh, it can it, are they available online? Yes, we we only have this one, <laughs> um, and it it is available on, on YouTube. And it's uh -huh. about it. We performed it, it was performed four times. Um, and the recording is from Bucharest. And it hasn't been processed, but um, the entire performance is filmed on YouTube. And I can send you the link to that as well, together with the other two. Uh, yes, yes, I will ask you. Uh, to send the link, to send the links, and I promise to everyone that I will publish to today these links, so everyone can find them and uh, use these links. And one more time, I can say that if uh, someone were, was interested today very, very much as I see this, uh, I remind because I've got two uh, requests. Uh, um, for sharing this lecture, and I remind to everyone that this lecture. After our techniques will make um, some cosmetic things with the lecture, it will be available on a, a University of Warsaw page, on a page of Collegium Carpaticum and Centre for East European Studies. And all links and publishing a lecture on YouTube, I will uh, post on a Facebook uh, immediately, so you can share this to those one who are um, who had no possibility today uh, to watch it. Uh, on 
uh, YouTube. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot, and hope to uh, for our future cooperation with such great topics. And of course, I wish you um, to make a more performances and more uh, interesting and so inspiring topics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you one more time and goodbye to dear Professor uh, Judah Bernstau from the Stefan Solomari University and to uh, those who are with us today on our YouTube channel.